Hey y'all. So I just had a fortune cookie and it said kind of appropriately, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. I was like, that fits. Let's start there. So I promise, you know, it's been a long day. You guys have drank from the fire hose. I promise nothing tonight will be hard. I never said anything complicated in my entire life. Believe me. Okay, so just to kind of recap very briefly, because I do want to get through this and I don't want it to take all night. Last night we talked, I gave a talk, I said I'm giving three lectures at this seminar, this workshop, and they have a theme together, which is the secret religions of the West, and the previous talk to kind of tie into the idea of mere simulacrity, I discussed the idea of the negation of the real. And of course we heard earlier from our friend Mike, aka Local Distance, a lot of detail about what that looks like, it should have started to kind of, some of these concepts might start to gel, even if you're not familiar with them. And the idea of that talk was that if you're going to introduce a fake religion or get people to adopt an old religion that is a, pre, a pretense to religion or to get people to believe in the pretense to science, a fake or a counterfeit science, then the first thing you have to do is obliterate their ability to understand reality. And uh, Mike Young's talk earlier today was very much along those lines. There was a kind of that sharp moment where he described the postmodern city. We went through the three postmodern philosophers, and he said that is the philosophy of America today, which was that we can't detect the real. So from there today, I want to take you into a, a talk that I'm going to call the Gnostic Parasite. And so we introduced the idea that there are these kind of three domains last night that we called faith, or I called faith, reason, and gnosis. And those three domains are what we're going to talk about. And what I was trying to set up or articulate is that faith and reason speak into reality, and they work really well together. And gnosis is something that takes advantage of their weaknesses. And so it, what I want to communicate tonight is that it actually works very much like a parasite upon those two, or we could say a virus, which is sort of a parasitic suborganism kind of thing. So it takes advantage of weaknesses, and that's going to kind of come up again and again. But what the idea is that we've got these th what the idea is, is that we've got these three, not two, big dispositions. People say, "Is woke a religion?" Well, it's a good question, and the answer is depends on what you mean by religion. Not to fall into the trap, because it's more accurately a cult, and it's in the benefit of the cult to make the for for the people in the cult to make other people believe that it's a religion. And is woke a science? Well, they call it a science. They call it the science. And it's to the benefit of the people in the cult to make people believe that it represents truer science. But what we're actually discussing with these three orientations is three competing dispositions toward knowledge and truth, and that these have lied underneath the West from its foundations you know, 2,500 years ago or more. A metaphor I want to build off for this talk is actually I want to take you into something Ben Shapiro presented very effectively, his idea that what makes Western civilization Western civilization is Athens plus Jerusalem. And I'm going to say that that's a stand-in, a symbolic stand-in for reason plus faith. And what I've articulated or started to articulate with this series of talks with the secret religions of the West is that there's a third disposition, not just reason and faith, which is basically not quite Hogwarts, but if you've read the books, but Durmstrang, the, the dark wizard place. It's wizards, it's sorcery, it's hermeticists and Gnostics using what we called small g gnosis. So what the full formulation, not to take away from, from Ben Shapiro in any way, but the full formulation should be about what makes Athens plus Jerusalem so great, besides what it provides in a positive sense, is that it boxes out a third geographical location that we use as a metaphor. Athens gets together with Jerusalem to box out Alexandria. And Alexandria, that portion of Egypt, is where allegedly at least the Hermetic faith arose. The god Hermes, that it's named after, is called in the Egyptian religions, Toth. Plato refers in the Phaedrus directly to the, 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 the claim, he, gives, he puts into Socrates' mouth the claim that the ideas that they're discussing come from this region of Egypt, from a god called Toth. 
who happens to be called Hermes. So the goal, though, is that reason and faith, what I want to communicate to you today, and it would point toward a solution, and I want to give you a lot more clarity on what this hermeticism, what this Gnosticism is, and what it, lo- what it looks like, how it works, but is that when reason and faith work together, they box out Gnosis. And so the goal of Gnosis is to make sure that one or both of those become corrupted enough or weak enough so that they can operate like a parasite and occupy the position held by one and eventually both. When I say corrupted, I mean made weak. I mean given into the kinds of temptations and corruptions that all hierarchies, all organizations, all institutions are susceptible to. But also this idea that they become subverted from within, that their very core values, their very core ideas get turned against them and transform into something that they aren't. And I use the word transform there deliberately because it's the word we hear in all of this literature all the way back and all the way forward to this very day with the 17 Sustainable Development Goals 2 and on their website, and I quote, transform our world, transformative SEL. It's everywhere. That's social emotional learning in your schools. So corrupted, I mean, Athens was corrupted. We can't hold Athens up like it's this pinnacle of reason. Um, could talk a lot about Plato. We would talk a lot about exegesis and authorial intentions. I think it would be a worthwhile project for us to start trying to dig through, say, the Timaeus and find out what Plato was really referring to. Um, according to Herbert Marcuse, if we take our hints from him in his 1955 book, Eros and Civilization, I think the exact phrase he, he uses is the love of boys. Science is also corrupted today. We don't have to look all the way back to the perversions of Athens. The science, COVID-19 policy, gender-affirming care. We can go on and on and on about the science and how science has been corrupted. So they can become corrupt. Mike talked about a large number of ways that that can happen. People can write fake papers. Ask me how I know. And then you can cite those fake papers, and you can build an entire body of fake literature by a number of different means. You can only publish in one direction rather than the other. We talked about that last night. There are lots of ways that science can become corrupted, and it is now. Jerusalem can also become corrupted. Faith isn't immune. Faith has to be done well. Heresies have arisen again and again and again and again. And given the context, so I just note that we're not going to put St. Augustine on a pillar here. That's not about to happen. That's a complicated topic for another day. But when he wrote... Confessions, he documented something like 83 or 82 or 81 or something like that, heresies in Christianity up to that day. There have been Jewish heresies, and a lot of them are mysticism. Moses goes up on the mountain, comes down with the tablets, they have a golden idol. Already. It's like, hey, let's just screw up. Hey, where'd our boss go? He's talking to God. What do you want to do? I don't know the exact wrong thing. How about that? He's not here. Let's go. And so Gnosticism has actually crept in quite explicitly. When we talk about capital G Gnosticism in a Christian context, we are actually talking about the Gnostic heresies. We're very specifically talking about especially the Valentinian heresies that were overthrown by Irenaeus. So those can become corrupted. There can be bad interpretations. There can be whack gospels that are not real. Introduced. There can be fake religious texts that are completely uh, apocryphal. Mystery and mysticism follow religion around like a ghost or a demon or something. This is always happening. There were Jewish sects of esoteric mysticism traced back at least to the second century BC. We have no reason to believe that they didn't go back further. Humans like to get mystical, it's just a thing. The problem is is that once reason and faith start to get corrupted, they can't keep Alexandria out because if they're getting into mysticism, especially they become Alexandria. And so we have the vision or the idea, the image of the Trojan horse. The Gnostic parasite works like a Trojan horse. It comes up and says, hey, this is this great thing. It's like a gift to your society. It's extra knowledge. It's extra wisdom. It's faith beyond faith. It solves the mysteries of your faith, blah, blah, blah. It puts knowledge where you're supposed to put trust, for example. And the next thing you know, you're a wizard, or in the wizard circle, or being manipulated, or in the 20th century, probably going to a gas chamber. 
Now, something you have to know and appreciate about these secret religions of the West is that they are not new, they are old, and they are well-developed. I brought that up last time. You have to pretend, remember, I asked you to pretend that there is another ancient world religion as well-developed, roughly, as Judaism or Christianity, that you just haven't heard much about. Because there is. The reason that you haven't heard much about it is really simple. They make fun of scholars who go into this. You might as well study parapsychology. You might as well study ESP. You might as well study aliens. Scholars get made fun of in scholarly circles for pointing out that this stuff, mysticism, has been a part of the developments of the West, whether that's the developments of science. Alchemy was big in that. Newton, Bacon, they were wizards. But they also did good work. Separating wheat from chaff has been the process by which things have been made better in these regards. Same in faith. But this is a well-developed religion, and we're pulling back a big curtain here. And that's what the point of these talks are. But they're, they're, they're very well-developed, and their followers are probably, and we heard this from Charlie Kirk yesterday, that, that George Soros is very effective, gives more money, blah, blah, blah. Why did he say that that was the case? Because he believes in his cause more than you do. They are very dedicated. In fact, when you get sucked into a cult, especially this kind of a cult, you become an obsessive, typically. There are comments from people who analyze the communists. For instance, Alexander Solzhenitsyn pointed out that you are getting very tired, and you might resonate with that. You might feel that. You're getting very tired. Charlie referred to that yesterday as well. What Alexander Solzhenitsyn said is, I assure you the communist is not tired. Where Marx said that religion is the opium of the masses, which is a conversation we could have for a different hour, communism works out to be more like the methamphetamine of the people. These religions may be as old as Exodus. They may, I mentioned that, that, that book a minute ago. They might be as old as that. Certainly, though, like I said last night, Plato references them explicitly. I said this at the beginning also today in, in the Phaedrus. So Plato explicitly is nodding to Egypt, explicitly nodding to the god Toth that is Hermes. When we read from the uh, Corpus Hermeticum, as we did last night, that's written in the voice of the god Toth. Or it's written in the voice of the mind of God speaking to the god Toth that elevated him to that status. So these are ancient religions, ancient religious traditions that have had thousands or millions of adherents that have had huge periods in history in which they were extremely popular throughout uh, the 15th through the 19th centuries, throughout Europe, for example. They've spun off secret societies, some of which you've heard of, some of which you haven't. They've done all kinds of things. And we have to grapple with their terminologies and their ideas because once we do, everything that you're experiencing in the world today that seems so crazy, so offbeat, actually gets simpler. And that's because we have to understand this concept of gnosis and it's embarrassing to scholars. They've dropped the ball. We can't rely on them. There are some who have written about this and written about it well, but they're few and far between. It's not mainstream. You're stupid in scholarly circles if you dare to mention that Marx might have been a mystic instead of an economist or a social theorist. Hate to burst your bubble, but for 150 years, Scholars have been wrong about Marx. They've been completely wrong about Marx and his project, what it is and what it means. And by keeping us arguing about social theory, political economy, and so on, economics and whatever, they've kept us in the wizard circle where we can't puncture through and see what Marxism is and stop it. And only 100 million people had to die and maybe a billion have their lives destroyed in the process. Or maybe billions if we look at China. It seems too silly too implausible to scholars. They don't believe in magic, so how could anybody so smart as somebody like Hegel have believed in magic? Well, I don't know, maybe they should read Hegel where he tells them over and over again that he believed in magic. Maybe they should read Hegel where he holds up next to Bacon. He says, Bacon's pretty good on this science stuff, but he's nothing to Jacob Boma, who was a wizard, who Hegel also said was Germany's greatest philosopher. And I guarantee you I didn't say his last name right. It's B-O with an umlaut, H-M-E. If you can pronounce it, you can have a cookie. So the weakness of science is already revealed. The weakness of reason or liberalism, if we want. Whichever of these things. These are just kind of 
placeholder words that are kind of in the same category, is revealed here. They take things seriously at, their, at its word. They're charitable. When somebody says something, they expect it's always to be treated as good faith instead of bad faith. When that guy on MSNBC runs his mouth, they think that's a good faith argument for whatever he's saying. But it might not be. It might be a spell. So they're weak to it. You can't treat magic that way. You must be discerning. Thus we see the necessity of faith, which is the, cat, the, 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 the dimension of discernment. The weakness of faith, though, is that it falls prey to what we keep hearing from the speakers here today. Emotion, particularly. Creative interpretation. Eisegesis posing as exegesis. Hermeneutical circles. That Schleiermacher stuff Bill talked about this morning. It also has a tendency to think that wizards who sound like they're in the same religion as them, that speak wizardry through Christianese by doubling up the meanings of Christian words, are brothers. And they're getting had. Oh, we can't call him out. He's a brother. No, he's a wizard. And you don't know. Because he's speaking a language similar to yours. That has major consequences that we're going to talk about. Because when they speak a language similar to yours, you can't tell it. But when they speak a language different to yours, it sticks out. But the three domains that have shaped the West are faith, reason, and gnosis. Gnosis is what's beneath these secret or esoteric religions that have been running the West. And we're going to compare and contrast those domains in this lecture. So the goal will be also to reveal how gnosis is a parasite on faith and reason. It mimics them, it pretends to be them, it changes the language so that it uses the language of science, it uses the language of faith, but in reality what it does is it substitutes itself in their place, casts the spell of the wizard circle, and actually casts out the people who could call them out. That's why communists always have to purge the bourgeois sciences. That's why the Nazis had to purge Jewish science. They had to get rid of it because it's stuff that could have called them out. These are uncomfortable topics, but it's very important to understand. Like we talked about last night, and I won't repeat it too many more times, I swear, is it negates the real, creates a simulation or a simulacrum of whatever it's occupying, takes its place, and it plays to faith and reason to mystify what those things mean, and if you actually listen, if you believe in what I call the Iron Law of Oak Projection, Marx talks constantly about how everything that sounds religious is a mystification of reality. And he's going to demystify reality with his scientific theory. Demystify, demystify. The Iron Law of Oak Projection says whatever he says they're not doing, that's what they're doing. So in other words, he's mystifying reality. He's acting as a sorcerer. The goal is to negate reality, like I said, to make room for the counterfeit. The counterfeits are the Gnostic cults. They can look religious. They can look scientific. In the classical sense, religious would be the Gnostic cults, the Hermetic cults, the straight-up esoteric religions where they got syncretistic throughout the Middle Ages. Turns out Hermetic faith is syncretistic by definition. It believes that all the faiths, like I mentioned last night, are facets, pieces of one faith. So if it wants to pick a little from this and pick a little from that and put them in the witch's pot and stir them together and have a new religion, it can do that. If it wants to take Gnosticism and Hermeticism and hammer them together, call it science and make it shaped like the Christian Trinity, which is exactly what Hegel did, it can do that. It doesn't have any rules. In this present age, since maybe the 1870s, it looks like theosophy or what we call new aginess. Hippies. The hippies are the not that bad part of it. But there are very bad theosophists doing great damage. It can also look modern or scientific. Alchemy is kind of the precursor of that. System der Wissenschaft, that's Hegel's system of science. Marx's Wissenschaftlicher Socialismus, the scientific socialism, the true scientific study of history. And in today's world, we have Anthony Fauci. And the CDC and the FDA and the blah, 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 blah. We have studies. I mentioned it last night. We have systemic micism. There are too many mics making shows about sharks. That's a scientific study. It can also be, and this is what Mike Young talked about earlier today, it can also be postmodern, and it can be woke. 
which exploits some of the pieces of the other things that we just talked about, science and faith, but it also goes into this realm where nothing can be counted on. Nothing seems real. It gets into language over everything, and that's where magic spells are cast, or mostly with language. Structuralism, post-structuralism are formal names for this. It dives into systemic oppression, systemic thinking. You end up with the idea that gender is a performance from Judith Butler, ripping off from scholars she didn't understand, including Jacques Derrida, that Vocal Distance talked about earlier. So, oh yeah, this thing that I am, how I act, when I feel like I'm supposed to present myself as female, I'm doing a performance, I'm faking it. Oh, well, everybody fakes it. It's like that old joke where Sigmund Freud is sitting there saying it's not that I want to have sex with my mother, everybody wants to have sex with their mother. Everybody's pretending their gender. It's all a performance, it's all a show, and therefore it can be transformed, it can change. And queer theory and gender-critical feminism get treated as a kind of better science that understands that some of this stuff isn't to be understood through recalcitrant nature and actual objective physical sciences, but rather through social constructivism. And queer theory is why all of this stuff with drag queen story hour, the trans phenomenon, destroying children, etc., is going on. Science and religion get negated as descriptors of realities and get replaced with counterfeits. That's the point. Gnostic cults do this in order to fill the space with themselves, just like viruses enter into a cell through the receptor sites, get inside and take out the cell's internal machinery and replace it with virus-making machinery. Your cell doesn't make parts to make new liver cells or new epithelial cells or new skin cells. Instead, the, skill, the, the cell makes new pieces to assemble new viruses that then the cell eventually dies, bursts out, more viruses go out, infect more cells. And that sounds really, really, really mean to call them that except that they very thankfully for me wrote a paper in 2016 right here at Arizona State University. Two professors, Bram Foz and Michael Carger, wrote a paper in 2016 at ASU titled Women's Studies as a Virus. And they explained that the ideal metaphor to describe their program, their teaching method, is a virus that can infect students, send them into other disciplines, and into careers and infect other institutions by bringing the ideology in like a virus getting in through different receptor sites. They compare themselves favorably to HIV, Ebola, SARS, and viruses that cause cancer because cancer represents, in their own words, true transformative change. They characterize conservatism as an immune system and explain that in this one case among all viral diseases, immune system Destruction of the virus is a bad thing. It needs to be allowed to run rampant to transform the body. If you wondered if it's a death cult, if they think that they can bring new hermetic life out of death, that's pretty certain proof. But they've said the goal. Cancer is transformative. That word comes up again. Because the goal of these secret religions is always to transform. Transform what? Transform man. Transform society. Transform the world. Transform nature into what? The Gnostics vision, what they believe they've seen in the glimpse of the divine intellect, the nose, the mind of God, the utopia that they picture there. It'll be sustainable and inclusive. So here's 17 sustainable development goals we're all going to get adhered to. We're not going to adhere to them. We're going to get adhered to them to transform the world into what Marx said, nature completing itself through man. What Hegel said, man's job is to complete nature, and so by doing complete God. And so if we say that it works like a virus, it's the same to say that it works like a parasite. They're roughly the same thing with different levels of biological sophistication, it turns out. They latch on, they get in, they are not alive on their own account. They don't feed themselves on their own account. They do so by getting their, their life from something else. It's not a symbiotic relationship. It's wholly to the benefit of the parasite and the cost of the host. They do this by copycatting. That's the hyper-reality we keep talking about. That's the simulacrum, the simulacrity, mere simulacrity instead of Christianity. They do that with this idea that I mentioned over and over again last night. We do the same thing you do, but we do it deeper and morally better. We're better than you. The thing you think you understand, you only kind of understand it. See, Anthony Fauci is the science. You think you did a scientific study and found that masks do or don't work, whichever one he didn't say on CNN the other day? 
Next thing you know, he says he's the science. You don't have a clear, deep understanding of the science like he does. And so whatever he said now is true. And we're just using masks to be a bit silly or glib. It can be anything. You don't understand how glaciers work because you didn't take into account indigenous knowledges. You didn't take into account feminist art. That's in the feminist glacier paper. No kidding. The game is what we heard from basically everybody. Dialectical inversion is the name I give to it. Everything that's happening is all the same. It's all politics by different means. That's what, what, what Mike talked about earlier, right? At the end of the day, it's all warring tribes. It's all politics. It's all one person doing politics by one means and calling it knowledge, and some other group doing politics by their means and calling the output knowledge because it benefits them. And so if it's all politics, here's all the reasons yours are bad, and now we get to have our go. They use terms like ways of knowing. So science does ways of knowing, but we have other ways of knowing. And hegemonic science wants to exclude other ways of knowing because they want to keep themselves in the positions of scientists. They want to be able to write their papers, get their grants, use that to justify getting, writing more papers and getting more grants. Everything is political, so your politics, my politics doesn't matter. Nothing is neutral. I just saw that on Twitter from a former conservative. There is no neutrality. There is no neutral position. Everybody is biased, to which I replied, your mom is biased, which if he accepts his claim is true. And it does this by co-opting the terminology and creeping in and also inventing new big word sounding terms like transdisciplinarity that sound really smart and scientifical, but they're only scientifical and not scientific. It steals words like love thy neighbor and faith. It steals words and transforms what they mean. Diversity, inclusion, social emotional learning, how anodyne it sounds. It's completely anesthetic, but good. Social emotional learning is like Bactine. You spray it on your arm. It feels better. Must be good. And that's how it works like a parasite or a virus. A parasite, you don't feel it. I'm from the South. I've had a tick or two bite me in my life. You don't feel the tick crawl up your leg. It's kind of amazing. You rarely feel the mosquito land on you. You sometimes get bit by the mosquito and never feel the bite. And then sometimes it bites you and you're like, oh yeah? And you get it. But the ideal parasite, you would never feel it. You would never know that it was there. And the tick might be on you for long enough to give you Lyme disease, which takes about 24 hours or so, if I understand right, without you ever knowing it's there. Because they have all kinds of means to hide themselves. Because if you figured out you had a parasite on you, you'd get rid of it. And that's very, very important. And the way that it gets in is by seeming undetectable, by saying we're the same as you, but we understand it slightly different. Bill talking about the differences in degrees. They're a square saying, no, I'm a circle that's a different size. And when you believe that it's a circle, then they stretch to fill all the space that you take up. So they take advantage once they creep in of different receptors. Viruses attach to different receptors. We all heard with COVID, oh, the ACE2 receptor, the ACE2 receptor. Don't quite know what an ACE2 receptor is, but it matters. There's a receptor where the virus attaches and then it can inject its DNA or whatever, RNA, depending, into your cell, transform what your cell does into a virus machine. This is where religion or faith gets weak to mysticism. Somebody starts sounding like they have a much deeper, much more satisfying interpretation of Scripture, something that resonates with you, something that gives you an emotive, effective, or even mystical experience, and you get sucked in. It's not religion, but it kind of looks like religion. The New Age stuff is really going to stick out. I'm spiritual, but not religious. It makes me feel really good. They use scientific and scientistic language where science has dominance to creep in under science. They call themselves the science. They call themselves scientific socialism. They call themselves a system of science. All kinds of things. The scientific study of history. It's not science, but it looks like it because it's scientism. When it's in a postmodern domain, it looks like manipulations of language because that's all you have. It looks like language games, advertising, marketing, propaganda, blurring of boundaries so that it's very difficult to tell what one thing is and what one thing isn't. Coming back to the faith domain, it latches onto 
very valuable traits that faith strengthens and encourages, like charity. Caring about people. Well, you're not caring about them enough unless you care about them the way we tell you to. There's a correct way to love thy neighbor. There's a correct way to minister to the poor. It's called socialism. Jesus was a socialist. Just go read your gospel. You hear these things. It co-ops the idea of love. It co-ops the idea of theological mystery and drags you in. And those are things that often people in religious contexts are seeking, they're craving, or they're satisfied by. This is how parasites pull you in. Let me give you an example using love, because obviously love is a big concept in, in Christianity. In hermetic thought, love has a different definition. It's a manifestation, they say, of the source spirit, the highest good, that gets brought in as a parasite trick under the phrase, God is love. But they mean something different by love and turns out by God. Because love in the hermetic tradition refers to the desire to affect self-completion and Gnostic illumination, which is reunion, partial or whole, with the one, with God. They even have a funny word. What do you suppose, what was the point of what happened on the cross? Atonement, right? They mispronounced this word in their secret clubs, atonement. And they spell it in some of their texts this way. They spell it with two hyphens, A-T hyphen O-N-E hyphen mint, at one mint. Atonement at one mint. Atonement means you come back at one with the whole. But when they mean the whole, they mean the undifferentiated God in their weird crackpot religion that they have the only path to return to. This has spun off, this perversion of love, where love now means the desire to affect self-completion and Gnostic illumination, partial or whole reunion with the one or with God, is spun off in recent years into a concept called critical love. Of course, there's got to be a critical everything, right? And should just call it all critical unhappiness and be done with it. It's a little bit hard to find a definition of critical love. I won't lie to you, I spent only about five minutes I've read a bunch of stuff about it. It's very difficult in general to find concise definitions for any of these, but I found a website that's literally dedicated to explaining critical love, and it said it is the beginning of equity. That's a pretty good definition, I guess. They say that it means caring about communities. They say it means caring about communities in service, where they get to define service, which is going to be socialism. But they very specifically indicate that critical love means the love that you have for the collective not individual or one-to-one love for one other person. Not love for yourself, not love for your spouse, not love for your children, love for the collective above those at one mint. So it's individuals loving communities that love individuals. So you love the community so that the community can love individuals correctly on your behalf. And you end up with a snake eating its own tail again. Individuals that love community, communities that love individuals, that love community, that love individuals, that love community, that love individuals. It's a circle that assumes its beginning and finds its own end. What kind of receptors does it tap into for reason or for liberalism in particular? Philosophical, cultural liberalism. Well, I said it in faith it hits charity and liberalism hits the other kind of charity. Not necessarily the, the, the ministering to the poor, but the taking the argument at good faith. Having an open mind. Oh, well, this person said gender is performative. Maybe that's correct. Let's spend years writing thousands of papers investigating it because it couldn't possibly be wholly wrong. I wouldn't be open-minded. It takes advantage of curiosity to find out more. Well, this is a hypothesis. Let's explore it. It takes advantage of freedom. The whole 100 flowers campaign that Mike talked about yesterday is a very operative example. We're going to let 100 flowers bloom in China. 100 flowers of free speech. Speak up, speak up. Freedom, freedom, freedom. You're gone if you spoke up wrong. What do they do when they get mad because they lost their beat people up stick on Twitter? What did they do? They started to be abusive to everybody on Twitter. And when people said, you're being abusive to me, they said, it's my free speech. Are you against free speech now? They try to use your values against you. This is what Elon Musk calls free speech. They beat him that way. And then they beat everybody else by saying, by abusing harassment and abuse and calling that free speech and using that to justify it. Don't you care about free speech? Oh, you care about debate. You care about this. You care about that. And they hold you to your standard 
while they don't hold themselves to the same standard. We could talk about Saul Alinsky and his rules for radicals here, where he says, hold the enemy to his standard. We could also talk about what we said from Eric Fogelin last night, where he said the idea is that you construct second reality so that it looks like it's accomplishing the thing in the first reality while evading accountability in first reality. They use your values against you, including your freedom. They can peaceably assemble, but all of a sudden when you do, it's, you do, it's not peaceable anymore. They demand that you take their ideas seriously. That's why they can't stand to be mocked. They can't stand satire. They have to throw the Babylon Bee off of the internet, which turned out to be a really bad strategic move for them because Mr. Musk was a fan. I'm thinking that guy had a bad day. The Babylon Bee made that joke before I did. They play Mott and Bailey games with you one way or another, as they're called, to credit Nicholas Shackle for the idea that he coined. They tell you, Yo, oh, no, 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 we're going to have more diversity. Diversity is great. Put it in the policy. Everybody thinks, well, I know what diversity means. It's wonderful. Then that definition shrinks once it's a policy, and it means that you hire people we say you hire. At first, diversity at one point in history means people that are different from one another. Next thing you know, you find out that only racial minorities count as diversity. So white people no longer count in a diverse caste. Something that's 100% black is 100% diverse. They said that, even though it's technically 0% diverse in the way that you thought the word meant 10 minutes ago. And then the next step is Larry Elder's not black because he's the black face of white supremacy because he has the wrong idea. So only black people who speak the proper critical language of blackness count and it shrinks further until it's just their commissars getting in positions. That's a Mott and Bailey game actually. They've shifted the definition. They do it the other way. You call them out on something and suddenly they say, we just want to teach kids honest history. We just want to teach kids social and emotional skills. It's just some very nice thing. And they thereby force you into their wizard circle or their frame or into their terminology. And the liberals get sucked into this like fools because they can't possibly understand or just go for the, the fact using discernment that what's happening is that they're being played in a game of three-card Monty, where the words are the cards that are moving around on the table to rip you off, or the cups, or whatever they use. They demand you treat their ideas charitably. They do not treat your ideas at all. Forget charitable. Everything you ever thought, did, said, is interpreted in the worst possible light to the point where they accuse you of being something like a sex trafficker. Just absolutely absurd. And then you have to give them every benefit of the doubt. And of course, they give each other every benefit of the doubt while giving you none. They also demand you give their ideas respect, which is why if you mock their ideas, you make fun of their ideas, they flip out. I call that the iron law of woke overreaction. But to respect their ideas means to let them keep talking and keep casting their spell and keep putting the wizard circle out there to draw more people in, even if they can't get you. So reality gets substituted out for Gnostic hyper-reality because reality got negated. If you guys saw the Harry Potter movie, the first one, where Voldemort's living on the back of Quirrell's head, that's what it looks like. You have the evil character latches on the back of the head like a parasite and is controlling what he's going to do, what he's going to think, telling him what to do, and he can't say no to the dark wizard that's now controlling him. And the purpose is to transform the subject. In that film, as a matter of fact, the goal was to transform Quirrell's body into Voldemort's body if he could just get the stone. So every time you see that word transform, train yourself to pause and turn on your discernment. It's not always a bad word. That's what makes it work. But it's very frequently a bad word, and you have to start to learn to see if they're doing alchemy, or if they mean it in some more mundane or even a direct Christian kind of context. Because what are they going to transform? They're going to transform you into their image because they are as God, which they believe is the only way because they believe that they are as God to transform you and the world to remerge back to the all. And you do that by obliterating the real, by obliterating distinctions, but first, in the personal sense, by obliterating yourself. 
In the hermetic religion, which we haven't talked about a ton yet, the goal is actually to obliterate your sense of individuality and selfhood, to raise yourself to the highest spiritual level that human beings can attain, which is called self-begotten. At that point, at the very end of that point, you get to merge back into oneness, into the undifferentiated whole. Hegel talks about this. There's a scholar, H.S. Harris, that commented on this, quoted in Glenn Alexander McGee's book, and he says, in Hegel's view, we have to annihilate our own selfhood in order to enter the sphere where philosophy herself speaks. In order to understand what Hegel calls philosophy, you have to destroy yourself completely. That makes you the philosopher or a philosopher king, somebody worthy of rule because you have the true wisdom. Or as Hegel himself described it, in science of logic, I think, maybe I've got that backwards, a mystic, a mystic. Marx describes this a little bit differently. Of course, he goes full blast materialist. Everybody knows that. He, that's how it's evaded being classified as a religion all this time. No, it's material. It's materialist. He's not only materialist. He went materialist like Feuerbach went materialist, but then he said, nope, Feuerbach didn't even go far enough. We're going to go double materialist. So he's super material, so it can't possibly be spiritual, right? But how does he describe communism? I read it last night. As the positive transcendence of private property. And private property is human self-estrangement. So what you're transcending is this estrangement of yourself by having private property. But what is private property? And this is going to be big in what we talk about tonight. What does private property actually indicate for Marx? Individuality. You're an individual who can own things. And he says that, that it's individ- you being an individual, a separate from your species, that's the problem. And that's what's caught up in private property. And he says that the point of transcending private property is to return to what man really is, which is a species being, a being that lives for his entire species. A communalist or a communist, which he called the riddle of history solved that knows itself to be the solution. So we see this idea that we're going to use transformation through this parasitic invasion. You're going to transform the cell into something that makes viruses. You're going to transform the science into something that produces fake science or scientism to propagandize for the fake religion. You're going to transform faith into something that just reaffirms the cult leader over and over and over again to transform in some grander vision, into what the mystic or the wizard thinks represents the all. The difference between what we normally think of as a cult and these huge religion-type cults is that the goal of these is to get everybody involved. Or, on the other hand, basically one person. A typical cult that we think of, oh, that's a cult. You got one guy who's basically trying to get with all your wives and daughters and get all your money. But it's the same process. And the reason that they're going to transform the world into what they want it to be is because they're Gnostic, and they know it. They believe they know with a G, and you don't. They know, and you don't. And that's the dividing line. That's the dividing line for all of their abuses. So many things follow from that. Why do they act the way they do with your kids in schools? Well, because you're a parent. You're not an expert. You're not a teacher. You never went to college and got a teaching certificate. They're better parents than you. They know how to raise kids and you don't. Why do they dictate your diet to you and tell you you have to eat bugs and you can't eat meat and you can't eat this and you can't eat that? Because they're better eaters than you. They know how to eat right and you don't. You might go to hate chicken Chick-fil-A. Why are they better managers than you that have to be in charge of everything? Because they know how to manage, because they know the goal, and you don't. Why are they better stewards than you? Because, or why, why do they treat themselves as better stewards? Because they believe they're better stewards than you, stewards of the environment, stewards of public health. Public health officials said we all have to do some stupid thing that ruins all of our liberty. Public health officials said give us all your freedom and we'll let you go. Totally real. Public health officials said, well, we're going to have to start experimenting with environmental lockdowns, climate change lockdowns, zones that you can't travel outside of too many days in Oxford already happening. They're better stewards of the environment. They're better stewards of humanity than you because they know and you don't. They're experts and you're not. They get to classify themselves as expert stakeholders. Patrick earlier said, were you guys surveyed? 
They got Patrick Wood, he asked, were you surveyed about the grand sweeping vision that Klaus Schwab has at the World Economic Forum? No. Who did they ask? Stakeholders. Who are the, you're the stakeholder, but they didn't ask you. It's your life. You hold the stake. That's a fake word, y'all. That's a magic spell. Who'd they ask? Expert stakeholders. They have a council of them. And I urge you to remember that the Russian word for council is Soviet. Why? Because they know better than you. In the preface to Encyclopedia Logic, which I quoted from last night and just referenced, Hegel explains this. Certain things he says, such as truth, to put it in the context, he doesn't say it directly there. It's kind of, I'm going to quote him, but it's a big paragraph explaining what he's talking about. Certain things, including truth, have two names, he's explaining. And the quote is, one in the language of gods and the other on the tongues of us men. So he sounds all humble because he's a wizard and a parasite. Pretending he's a man when he's already told you he's a philosopher. They believe they know God's definitions and language for things and you don't. So they play language games. They know what diversity really means. You don't. So they have to control what diversity means in the policy. That's how it works. They know what sustainability means. It means sustainability of their regime. And you don't, so you're tricked. Their superiority, their pretense to expertise, all of it follows from this belief that they understand and you don't because they're Gnostics. They are initiates into the initiate society and you are not. They know what words and thus the word, the logos, really mean and you don't. Like I said, they're in the initiate society. And if it's about language, when we get to this postmodern era especially, and transforming the meanings of words, and there is no objective thing to grab onto because they've dissolved that, they've turned it liquid in the words of another philosopher that is a bit cracked, Sigmund Bauman, calls it liquid modernity instead of postmodernity. Since you have nothing to grab onto, they can control you, and they create when it's just about this language, this linguistic fluid, oh, gender means this, no, it means something else tomorrow, no, it means something else the next week. When it's all fluid like that, they create the people who know and the people who don't know. In other words, they create decentralized initiate societies, and if you know the words, you're in, and if you don't know the words, you're not in. If you know the words, then you know the words' meanings in the correct mind of God sense, not on us tongues of men, and so you deserve to rule. And if you don't, you don't. There are no conspiracies needed. They're there. They're extra. You can do it in a completely decentralized way. You can create cult initiate societies just by transforming the way people understand words and symbols that they interact with and then force other people through social interactions or coerce, I should say, or exhort other people to follow those same meanings until they become hegemonic and dominant. The thing is, is the initiates, when they hear the word diversity, what they know is that means people that we approve of and not people we don't approve of. It means people who know, not people who don't know that what it means is something different than what it seems like it means. They also know implicitly who to support and who not to support. People, all that buzzword, boilerplate, jibber-jabber that came out of every institution, every corporation, every university, right after George Floyd died was a signal. It was, the, it was the blood of the lamb put across the top of the door. It was a signal. Support us. Anybody who doesn't do it, send Antifa to burn down their building. They support each other. The people who talk like them, who use the words in the weird ways like them. This is why Kamala Harris gets up, sounds like she doesn't know how to speak English repeatedly. And says stuff like, we're going to do things together, together, so we can come together to do things together, because together we're going to do things that are together. It's because she has to just keep saying the word together, because it's a signal that's like, don't wreck me. I'm on your club. This is why we have to understand these three domains, faith, reason, and gnosis. And again, these are broad strokes. These are dispositions toward knowledge. I'm not going to take, we don't have to take them too literally. We shouldn't take them too strictly literally. These are big fuzzy concepts. Each one deserves a semester's philosophy course or more. That's not what we're trying to do here. We're just using these as kind of placeholders for three dispositions toward knowing. And so let's start by talking about faith, and I'm going to compare it against gnosis, then we'll do reason and compare it against gnosis, and we'll just talk about gnosis a little bit. What's faith? 
Well, your Bible tells you, go to Hebrews 11, 1. I guess if I was Trump, I would say, go to Hebrews 1, 1, colon 1, or something like that. Now, faith is the confidence of what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And that's an interesting, by the way, Hebrews 11 is an interesting chapter. It uses the word faith over and over and over and over. It does not use synonyms. It does not say faith this time and to make it more readable something else another time and to make it more readable something else another time. Then they circle back and use faith again. It says faith, 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 something like 34 times. Over and over, same word. And it says it's the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we, don't, or what we do not see. It is being very clear on giving you instruction in what faith looks like and what it does not look like. But what you hear when you hear that it's in this first verse, when you hear that it is confidence in what we hope for, it's inherently humble. That is key. Faith is inherently humble in its disposition toward its claims of knowing. It's confidence. It's not certainty. It doesn't say, now faith is being certain in what we hope for. That's foolish. There's all kinds of admonitions in the Bible against that kind of thinking. It inherently confesses hope and trust, but not knowledge. Confidence, assurance. doesn't say it's what we know to be true because we said it, which is gnosis. It's confidence and trust in something bigger and greater. If you're religious, that's God. And you guys are Christians, you got the whole tradition. I'm not going to get into that. It's yours. I'm not going to step into there and get all messed up here. If you're not religious, all you have to do is have a concept of that which is bigger than all of us because it has in common the same disposition with the religious concept of God. I'm not saying it's the same. I'm saying it has something in common with it, which is something that I am definitely not. In fact, something that I am far less than and must humble myself before. Humbling yourself before the greatness of creation, whether you believe that's connected to God or that it's just a fact of the universe for whatever reason you don't claim to know, displaces man from the center of creation. God creates, man does not create. That humbles you. This disposition of humility is so important. The point, as I mentioned yesterday when Charlie was on the panel of Getting power, if you are faithful, is to serve. What we call the people we elect to office, other than, I was going to say a bad word. Servants, public servants. I know, laugh. It's an aspiration. What (laughs) What is gnosis? It would be confidence in what we hope to create in praxis by bringing it into actuality. It's confidence that we can change the world into the thing that we envision, that we know is the destination we're supposed to get to, which is why they're not daunted by failure, because they're just learning more about how they're going to get there. And this is literally the concept behind what Marx called the creative subject, which is what he said is the first kind of step toward man knowing who he is. He said, in creating a world of objects by his practical activity, in his work upon inorganic nature, man proves himself a conscious species being. That is, a being that treats the species as its own essential being, or that treats itself as a species being. Did that sound like he just kind of said something in a circle? (laughs) It proves that man is a species being by proving that he's a species being. It's the same definition Ibram Kendi gave for racism. Racism is when racism happens. I love you, Janae. (laughs) Just saying. But he says, by doing your work, you prove that you're a communist. That's what he says. By creating a world of objects around himself, he proves that he's a conscious species being, a conscious communist. That's what he says. If you know what species being means, it's a person who works and lives for the species ahead of the individual. It is just in his work upon the objective world, Marx tells us, therefore, man really proves himself to be a species being. This production of his active species life, this is, sorry, this production is his active species life. 
Through this production, that's what it means to be human, is to produce for humans. Thus, this production, nature, uh, through this production, sorry, nature appears as his work and his reality. The object of labor is therefore the objectification of man's species life, for he duplicates himself not only as in consciousness, intellectually, but also actively in reality, and therefore sees himself in the world that he has created. Confidence in what we create in praxis by bringing it into actuality would be the Gnostic statement of faith. That's not faith. It's not humble. It's certainty that they can create the world that they think is supposed to be there. And Marx tells you that's what actually makes you human. This is inherently arrogant, the Gnostic position, not humble. It places man at the center of creation. Man sees himself in the world that he has created. You could continue that and says and knows himself to be who he is, the creator. Marx, like Hegel before him, assigns man the task of completing man in nature. That comes from the hermetic task assigned to man in a metaphysical sense of completing God himself. God, being completely undifferentiated perfection, lacks but one thing in the hermetic cosmog uh, cosmogony. The ability to know what he is because there is no distinctions. So he pours himself out into the world, creates a thinking being that can find and resolve the distinctions and come to know who he is. So man's job in the hermetic faith is to complete God by figuring out who God is, seeing God in his own mind, at which point God will realize in his mind that he is what is in man's mind. That's literally the project. Hegel accepted it whole cloth, whole thing. Hegel, Marx, the Hermetic mythos repeat this idea that's to come back to at one minute with the whole by removing all distinctions, so they create this method called the dialectic to do it. Because distinctions are reality and we have to negate the real. Quoting from Glenn Alexander McGee on this issue, he says that Hegel shows that when the subject transforms objects according to his will or rages and destroys that which resists his desire. Well, there's communism, folks. There it is, isn't it? Transforms objects according to his will or rages at and destroys that which resists his desire. It is really being moved by the desire to confront itself. The desire of the subject to annul the other and absolutize itself is just the same thing as to be confronted with the self and no other. In other words, to return to the undifferentiated one, which is God, which is supposedly your true nature. The goal of the Gnostic subjecthood is not to serve, but to bend the world to one's will, to dominate, to control, and to destroy everything you can't control. And is that not what you see in its fruit? If we take the faith-driven instruction to judge the tree by its fruit, is that not what we've seen for a century? Is that not what we see now? And controlling means bringing into line with the wizard's vision of being. What's an example? Critical race theory is going to get racial justice. What's it look like? Nobody knows. They never tell you, but how are we going to get there? They're going to call everything that they don't control racist until they control it. And then they're going to do that again and again and again and again until racial justice appears. That's how. Like Mark said, ultimately, we don't have these distinctions. We're a species being. We're not separated by things like race or from Mark's class. We have to be a species being, a communist. He says, in estranging man from one nature and to himself, his own active functions, his life activity, estranged labor, meaning being have to go to work, estranges the species from man. It changes for him the life of the species into a means of individual life. See, the thing that you have to destroy is the individual so you can return to the collective whole. And secondly, it makes individual life in its abstract form the purpose of the life of the species. So people in a collective exist so that people can be individuals, is what he's saying, and that's not so good. Because he says, likewise in its abstract and estranged form. So by separating from the whole, believing yourself an individual, you are estranging yourself from who you really are. And your goal, just like in Hermeticism, is to remove the distinctions and get back to what you always were. 
He says, Mark says that this process of labor reduces man to an animal, but actually even worse than an animal. An animal that's had even the joys of its life removed from it. And his solution is to abolish private property, which is the, the basis of individualism, and also ownership, and also labor. In other words, Marx's idea is very simple. If you can just, private property being the symbol, if you can just destroy the basis for otherness between people entirely, if you just get rid of it, or positively transcend it, actually, then you return to the whole. We're only individuals because we believe we can have stuff. So if we get rid of the idea of having stuff, then we're not individuals anymore, or we won't be for long. We'll come back together. Imagine all the people. Private property, as we'll talk about shortly, implies individuality, and that is kind of the core of the classical liberal position. But I want to compare. We've heard a little bit of Marx here. I also want to compare how just arrogant this is, not just by talking about Marx and Hegel and asking you to accept that this is a whole, like, hey, James said this is hermetic, so we have to believe it. And he quoted one guy, so that's probably right. I'm just going to read you from the Corpus Hermeticum on this flavor. This is a little bit long. This book is weird. Um, so this starts out weird, and then it starts to sound religious but weird, and then it gets real bad in a Gnostic way real fast. And this is from book one of the Corpus Hermeticum, which I told you last night's in 17 books. I think 14 of them survive, at least in part. This book is the only one with a special name. It's called the Poimandres, which is something you've probably never heard of. The Poimandres identifies himself at the beginning of this book as the voice of God, speaking directly to the god Hermes, or to the demigod Hermes, or Toth, speaking directly from mind to mind, God's mind to the Poimandres, speaking into Hermes' mind. And Hermes is speaking back to him in the passage, asking him a question, or no, just commenting, sorry, on what has already been revealed where I'm going to break in. Hermes says, you've taught me these things as well as I wished, O oh, nos. Now tell me, how, uh, tell me how I can find the way back to oneness, to full reunion with God. Tell me how the way back is found. In other words, in the context of the creation myth that I have not imparted and that's in the Poimandres, how do we undo the fall of man and his segregation from the pleroma, the, the spiritual fullness of God, the realm of the spiritual fullness of God? And the Poimandres replies to, uh, to uh, Hermes, allegedly, I have a problem with Hermes existing. He says, first, in the dissolution of the material body, one gives the body, up its, uh, body itself up to change. So you have to dissolve the material body to give it up to change. Doesn't that sound familiar to some stuff going on? The form you had becomes unseen and you surrender to the divine power, your habitual character, now inactive. Remember in the four olds where we're supposed to destroy old habits? The body senses return to their own sources. They then become, uh, then they become parts again and rise for action while the seed of emotions and desire go to mechanical nature. So you're separating the spiritual out from the material, very much like you're doing, say, separating the gold from the garbage when you do alchemy. Thus, man starts to rise up through the harmony of the cosmos. Doesn't that sound fun? Doesn't sound great? To the first plane, he surrenders the activity of growth and diminution. To the second, the means of evil, trickery now being inactive. To the third, covetous deceit. See, it sounds like you're talking about virtues at this point, right? Now inactive. And to the fourth, the eminence pertaining to a ruler being now without avarice. To the fifth, impious daring and reckless audacity. And to the sixth, evil impulses for wealth, all of these being now inactive. And to the seventh plane, the falsehood which waits in ambush. Then, stripped of the activities of the cosmos, he enters the substance of the eighth plane, which is the self-begotten plane, with his own power, and he sings praises to the Father with those who are present, those who are near rejoicing at his coming. Being made like to those who are there together, he also hears certain powers which are above the eighth sphere, singing praises to God with sweet voice. Then in due order they ascend to the Father, and they surrender themselves to the powers, and becoming the powers, they are merged in God. This is the end, the supreme good. Remember, we were asking, how do we get the path back to what we were always in the beginning? This is the end, the supreme good, for those who have had the higher knowledge. And I quote directly, to become God. 
Well then, Poimandre says, why do you delay? Should you not, having received all, become the guide to those who are worthy so that the human race may be saved by God through you? You don't just have to become God, you have to become Christ too. That's the explicit command in the Corpus Hermeticum. That's the explicit project of the secret Hermetic religion. That's at the basis of Marxism, Hegelian thought, and all kinds of other crazy stuff, including New Age spirituality. Not to sound like some kind of a boomer who's down on that stuff. Not just you, but the human race is to be saved by you. Don't delay. You must become your own Christ to save all of humanity by becoming God. Faith, whatever it is, if you don't like the Hebrews definition, I don't know why any of you would have a problem with it. Somebody out there might. Faith is not that. If I don't know what faith is, maybe, it's, I know it's not that. Faith is belief in a higher God that you are not. It is piety. It is religion. It's being God-fearing and thus profoundly humble. So what about the comparison? What is reason and what is that domain and how does it compare? Nature's God, we could call it, as our founding fathers did, kind of giving a kind of cheap stand-in answer because they didn't know what else to say. We might refer to the actual scientific methodologies. It seeks truths that it sees are provisional, which means it holds them in humility. The problem is that it requires wisdom so that it doesn't get out over its skis as you were. In a sense, what makes man human, if I had to give the answer, and most people throughout history have given this answer when it comes to some kind of a press, is his capacity to reason, which is definitely distinct from that of all of the other creatures. So if we see that as being in the image of God, but not God, image is not the thing, then we see that faith is grounding reason. It's keeping its feet on the ground. But remember that reason was a key word for Hegel. The wizards need to occupy that word. In fact, it was his higher level understanding of science. So it becomes a dual captured term. And in fact, science we talked about was in fact the same thing for Plato, scientia, which referred to having two levels, episteme and dianoia, just like Hegel had it in Vernunft and Verstand, and the critical theorists had it in critical and traditional. Marx had it in socialist and not socialist. And the, this is what reason is, though. Reason is the ability to think through these things, to understand the world that we're in, to comprehend the world that we're in, and it appeals to what we might refer to as nature's God, making not too many claims necessarily upon what that is or what it might be, just in case we're wrong. That's, again, a disposition toward humility. So where the church becomes the fruit of faith, liberal society is the fruit of reason. Everybody gets upset about liberalism, especially in conservative circles, because it's badly misunderstood. The American experiment is the thing I mean by the word liberal. I don't mean woke people. They are not liberal in any regard whatsoever. They are anti-liberal. Liberalism, and you've probably never heard it this way, I think rests at its very bottom on a very parsimonious answer to the question of what's going on here. What's the world and what are we in it? That's the big ontological question. And it's very parsimonious. It's very circumspect in what answer it will give. It doesn't want to say too much is what that means. So it says that something like God or nature's God or nature at least is real and can be known about. And it makes no claim on which one of those things is the real, is the right answer to that question. So reality exists and can be known about because it's ordered. In other words, we call that Philosophy, or in the Greek to exaggerate, philosophia, the love of wisdom. Not just sophia, which would derive sophistry, which is wizardry. It's using words wrong to pretend you know things you don't. So it's something like that which is greater than any of us exists. That's premise one. And two, we're not that. We're not that. A lot follows from that belief, that humility of, of, of reason which is reinforced and girded when it has faith connected to it. Reason, the classical liberals understood, is something that is limited and fallen. We are corruptible. Maybe we're wholly corrupt. That's a question for Mr. Calvin. 
but it's limited. We aren't God. If you follow from that premise, we're not God. We can't know everything. That, in practical terms, immediately limits authority. It limits political authority. It limits authority one over another. It limits scientific or epistemological authority. I don't get to say I know just because I know or because I have a PhD or because I am Anthony Fauci or whatever else. I am an expert. That's not enough. In faith, the belief is that God alone holds authority, the ultimate and only true authority, especially in some sense moral authority. And a limited authority in man From that, therefore, follows, we must have freedom of belief. Freedom of religion is a starting place, but belief entirely. We can't compel somebody to believe, because what if we're wrong? If I compel you to believe in my vision of God and I'm wrong, I damn you too. If I coerce you or exhort you or trick you or seduce you to believe, I get a millstone, is what it says. That's bad. And so a reasonable approach says we can't do that. If we take it from the position of looking at nature or nature's God, it's epistemic authority. We must have freedom of speech. We must have freedom of thought. We must have freedom of assembly. We must have the capacity to test claims. And we only give authority to what proves itself to work. Nobody gets to be just the expert because they're the expert. They might be wrong. And if they're wrong, there will be consequences. The Bill of Rights follows immediately from this conception of liberalism. Especially what I was just talking about. We've got the First Amendment. We're protecting free, uh, free speech, belief, assembly, etc. We've got, we'll get to it, even the Second Amendment. We've definitely got the Fourth Amendment to protect your property. The Bill of Rights follows straight from these concepts. The entire American experiment tumbles out of this assumption, this very, very humble assumption that, yeah, the world is real and we can know something about it and it appears to be ordered, but we're limited. Therefore, we are not God. Therefore, we don't have authority to say anything absolutely. In other words, we can't be Gnostics. When reason is functioning uh, properly, we cannot be Gnostics. Worldly authority in liberalism is borrowed, and it's always subjected to reason. You have to prove yourself. You have to convince a plurality of your peers to lend you authority. We're going to adjudicate claims through reasoned debate, logic, observation. Huge, huge fights in science went on for decades, say in the the, the science of geology as it was emerging, Until finally, somebody stood up and said, let's look at the rocks. And the rocks settled the fight, and it settled the question. So what we are in a classical liberal sense, we are individuals who live in a real world that is somewhat comprehensible, who can kind of of reason. So reason becomes an aspiration for us that we try to apply. Marx has this all upside down. Marx says it's because we are social, that's why we're able to reason. Reason is a function of our sociality. So the more reasonable we are, the more social we are, and the more social we are, the more reasonable we are, which is the circle assuming its own end as its beginning or however that goes. But Locke understood this much more clearly, and thus Jefferson following from him. Jefferson said, how in the world are we going to, sorry, Locke said, how in the world are we going to preserve this idea? How are you going to preserve freedom of belief and conscience? Freedom of thought and speech. And he said, well, it comes down to really three fundamental inalienable rights that must come from God or nature's God. And those are life, liberty, and property. Because if they can lock you up, kill you, or take you out of your property, including your body, then you can be compelled to to claim to believe at least something that you don't believe. They can prevent you from having free thought and free belief if they can kill you, lock you up, kick you out of your house, inject something in your body against your will. These are the basis, therefore, of individualism. You must secure the rights to life, liberty, and property if you want people to be able to be recognized as individuals against a much more powerful sovereign that wants to drive them into a collective that serves the sovereign's will. We call such a person a tyrant. We can't own things unless we're alive, free, and not somebody else. 
These become the basis of the individual. They also, for Marx, became the basis for human self-estrangement. If I can own a thing, that means you can't own it without giving me something that satisfies the claim that I have on the thing in some way, like money or something symbolic. He hates labor because labor is a function of ownership. Ownership is, an indiv is a symbol of, in uh, uh, a tool of individuality, and individuality separates you from the whole. So the whole American experiment is based on exactly the opposite of Karl Marx. It is to uphold individuals, the individual in liberty. It is to recognize and try to come up with a system that understands the limitations of reason, to stay humble, to not think we're smarter and better and more expert than we actually are. Because it starts from the premise that whatever we mean by the word God, whether it's God or nature's God or something symbolic, holy, we're not that. It's bigger than us. So we're going to borrow political authority because if who deserves it? Nobody. We're going to divide powers so that no power can get out running and take over. We're going to use the rule of law, not the rule of an individual. The law is a disembodied thing. Because then we have something approx approximating an objective standard at any given moment that we can say, this is how we're going to judge. And then we have a legislative process by which we say, maybe these laws need to be rethought. It's a fairly brilliant system. Jonathan Rausch, in a book that's uh, prescient, is written in 1992, it's called Kindly Inquisitors, explains liberalism in a very succinct way. He says it's two principles. Nobody gets the final say and nobody has special authority. No Gnostics is what that boils down to. Nobody gets final say. Nobody has special authority. And what, that cre what you have to create around that, he says, is a system of conflict resolution between differences that minimizes violence as the means of settling the differences. I've used a metaphor of a baseball bat. You think of society as a baseball bat. You want to keep upright. That's when society's functioning. And I did this weird thing because what you think you'd want to do if you wanted to keep the bat upright is just grab onto it and hold it, right? That's great until somebody decides to hit you with it. But if you have your hand underneath the pommel and you're holding it up this way and balancing it and it's wobbling and you're moving your hand, you can't hit anybody with it. That's liberalism. Liberalism is the project of keeping society upright without anybody grabbing the reign of power that they can become a tyrant. That's the project. And the reason is simple. It's because whatever God means, we're not that. That's it. So reason calls out Gnosis as un is inherently unreasonable. Oh, really? You talked to God through your hair dryer. Oh, you had a special counsel with God in your bathtub. Oh, you know, you had a dream and you woke up and now we all have to have an environmental policy. No, that's not reasonable. Prove your case. Show the studies. Check the methods. Check them again. Gnosis tries to parasitize this by claiming to be a system of science, science of logic, blah, 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 scientific socialism. They say these things over and over again. Transdisciplinarity, they say in the woke. Sounds real high tech. What it means is cramming the social sciences and humanities into the sciences. They tell you that's what it means. Gnosis claims that it has higher reason. Not regular reason, higher reason. Special access reason that only they have and you don't. You can't use your lying senses to figure it out. You can't use your methodologies as politics by another means. It places fernumft reason over firstand, which is understanding, or episteme over dianoia. These are just historical examples of the same thing being manifested. It uses two-dimensional thinking by putting critical dimensions into traditional theories that understand things. It uses alchemy, as George Soros told us, in place of simply the scientific method. And we read about it again in the Corpus Hermeticum. We go all the way back. Book 12, Hermes speaking to his acolyte, Tat. The present subject is knows its powers and variations. We have said that it is one thing in men, but another in irrational, in irrational creatures. Your mind is one thing in men and another in irrational creatures. Again, in other creatures, it is not beneficent. In each man, as it quells passion and desire, it acts differently and is necessary to realize that there are some men who possess reason, logos, reason reserved for the Gnostics. That's my parenthetical. But Logos is in the text. 
and others who do not. There are men who possess logos and others who do not. But all men are subject to destiny from birth, uh, both birth and death, for these two are the beginning and end of destiny. All men suffer what has been ordained, but those with reason, who, as we have said, are led by nos, by divine mind, by gnosis, do not suffer as others do, being themselves not evil. They suffer as men who have been released from evil. And now stuff's getting dark. Tat says, wait a minute. He says, again, Father, what do you mean? The adulterer is not evil. The murderer and all the rest are not evil. Those are things that he says. Wait, you're saying people with nose, Gnostics, aren't evil? Well, what if they're an adulterer? What if they're murderers? That, that, are they not evil? And Hermes replies, they are. But the suffering of one with reason will not be as an adulterer, but as if an adulterer. Not as a murderer, but as if a murderer. It is impossible to escape the state of death, just as it is impossible to escape the state of birth. But for the one who has knows, it is possible to escape evil. So when a Gnostic does a bad thing, it's not bad. And now their double standards are explained in book 12 of the Corpus Hermeticum. Isn't that weird? Gnos means the divine mind. So Gnosis, that's why they have double standards. That's why it's not wrong when they do something bad. They were doing it for the greater good, which they understand in the nose. You don't have it, so when you do it, it's bad. They protest, it's for justice. You protest, it's an insurrection. They have nose, you don't. You protest wearing masks. They say it's right-wingers going nuts, public health disaster, super spreader event. George Floyd dies, millions of people running around in the street like crazy. Racism's more important. We have no's. It's not evil when we do it. When we burn down stores, when we shut down buildings or our businesses, we understand something higher. AOC got all defensive about why they were stealing because they're hungry or whatever other nonsense. It's not wrong when they do it. Gnosis allows them to absolve themselves of any guilt for wrongdoing. Reason would never allow that. That's why postmodernism destroys, especially the reasonable person standard. If there's no reasonable person, because we're all biased, there's no reasonable person standard. There's no standard that we can accept for what is and isn't okay. This is a dialectical theft of goodness. The wizards become good because they alone have reason. Everyone else has false consciousness and is like an animal, like an irrational being without logos. It gets worse if we actually go a couple paragraphs earlier in the corpus here. It says, human souls that are not governed by no suffer the same as the souls of irrational creatures. For no merely powers those souls and gives them up to desires. The souls are carried to desires by the force of appetite, which leads to loss of reason. Just as it is with the unreasonable nature of beasts, such souls do not cease in being unreasonably angered and unreasonably desirous, nor can they have enough of these evils. For anger and desires are evils without reason, without limit, and it is for these souls that God set up the law as a punishment and as a test. Gnostics are, in their own estimation, better than you, and now we can read from Marx where he does this stuff with the animals, and he talks about the people who lack the Wissenschaft Lichter Socialismus, the people who are not socialist man. And he says, external labor, this is Karl Marx right after the corpus, labor in which man alienates himself is a labor of self-sacrifice, of mortification. Not the good kind of self-sacrifice, of killing yourself, not literally. The external character of labor for the worker appears in the fact that it is not his own but someone else's, that it does not belong to him, that in it he belongs not to himself but to another. It belongs to another and it is the loss of the self. As a result, therefore, man, the worker, only feels himself freely active in his animal functions. He becomes like a beast. Eating, drinking, procreating, or at most in his dwelling and in his dressing up, etc., and in his human functions, he no longer feels himself to be anything but an animal. What is animal becomes human, and what is human becomes animal. Certainly, eating, drinking, procreating, etc. are also genuinely human functions, but taken abstractly, separated from the sphere of all other human activity, and turned into soul and ultimate ends. They are animal functions. The same message as Book 12 of the Corpus Hermeticum, a little strangely. It's not that strange when you realize that they're both Gnostics. 
Gnosis, by comparison to reason and faith, is revealed truth. It's absolute knowledge. It's secret or hidden or initiate knowledge. Remember, it worships esoteric gods or the esoteric God, the God beyond all gods that everybody doesn't even know about because they know more than you. It focuses on consciousness. It generates cults. It acts in arrogance. It carries certainty. And it predisposes people and attracts people who are megalomaniacal. It is not faith because it's not confidence or hope. It's presumed certainty. It believes it is seen an image of the divine intellect and its plan. It is not reason because reason doesn't do this. In Hegel's words, it is the circle that runs back into itself, presupposing the beginning it reaches in its end. That's circular reasoning, which is not reasoning. But it can look like reasoning if you talk in a circle well enough. It's a hyper-real or simulacrum of reason. If you run the argument in a circle, you can trick people into thinking you made an argument when you got to the place you actually started. Circular reasoning. What is gnosis? We read it yesterday. I'll read it again from the translator's forward to my copy of Corpus Hermeticum. The heart of the Hermetic teaching contained in this book is the realization that the individual is fundamentally no different than the supreme. There's your one-sentence definition. This realization is gnosis, a single immediate event characterized as a second birth. This teaching outlines a spiritual path that prepares the way for this gnosis, which is not achieved by any effort of the ordinary mind. The words of the teacher work independently of the disciples' thinking. The point of these treatises is not to argue the truth of their propositions. Their meaning is the change they affect in the hearts of their readers or listeners in awakening them to the truth. It is the beginning that it finds in its own end or whatever. The Gnostic creation story holds that Gnosis is revealed knowledge of a true God that lies behind the God of the religions or behind nature's God. But it sees those things, nature's God or the God of the religions, your God, as a demonic architect or artisan called the Demiurge. It is evil, it is not good, because it was born in the sin of wisdom who wanted to create, which wasn't its station. So it alienates man from his true nature, imprisons him in the world, imprisons him in being, imprisons him as a spiritual being in the mundane, locks him in a mortal body that's going to die, that's made of material, that gets sick. And in a world that is fallen in material and filled with perils and evils and diseases. Gnosis of this truth opens the door in the faith to an escape from the prison. That means when you construct a hyper-reality, if you can make it real, you get out of prison. It's how they actually do it. Gnostics, therefore, create and project hyper-realities because they simulate what they think is really real, the image of the divine plan. Of course, they're doing the iron law of woke projection, as they always do. But this starts to make sense of what we read from Marx earlier, because Marx is a Gnostic. He believes that God is a prison. We compared that part of the Hermeticum and Marx, and I said they're similar, and then you thought maybe they're not that similar. But once you realize that Marx is a Gnostic, at least as much as he was a Hermeticist, apparently because it's similar to what we just read in the Corpus Hermeticum, and you realize that he saw the bourgeois class and his materialism as the demiurge, as the false demonic god, all of this starts to make sense. The bourgeois class controls the means of production and creates a prison out of being for all of the proles, the proletariat. And Marx isn't interested in spiritual liberation, he says. He's interested in a materialist approach where they seize the means of production, the conscious, the socialists, seize the means of production and become something like God by creating the perfect world out of that. They bring man back to his species being, his character, thus liberating man from the prison of being the fall that individuated him by having private property in the world. In some sense, what we have then is Marx is saying, Plato was roughly right about the structure of society, but he was evil. Or sorry, but Marx is evil. I said that wrong again. Marx is saying that Plato is right about the structure of society, that philosopher kings is from the Republic, is what I was referring to. My notes are a little crappy there. I added that late. The philosopher kings should rule over everything. There's a pyramid on top. And Marx says, you know what? That, sh- that shape is right, but it's upside down. You shouldn't have the philosopher kings on top of the guardians, on top of the workers and merchants, on top of the hoi polloi. You should flip it over. Put the proletariat on top. Let every piece fall down in the vanguard 
the Marxists are going to be the ones that get to be on the new top of society. That's what Marx is saying. Plato's republic shape, which is a straight-up tyranny, is correct, but it's upside down. It's evil to put the philosophers on top. There should be Marxists on top. What we see in the above, if we go through this Gnostic creation myth, though this Gnostic belief of an evil demiurge, what he does is it seems that he took from the Hermeticum and made it materialist and Gnostic. Those with Gnosis or Gnos are the rational socialists who understand that man's nature is as a species being. Those without Gnos are irrational and reduced to something like animals. They feel their human nature, in fact, things that are human to their, to their experience as Animal. They feel like humans when they're doing animal things like eating and drinking and procreating. That causes them to give in to those animal drives, those desires mentioned in the Corpus Hermeticum, and they become ruled by their desires, which is what it warns if you are a man without nose in the Hermeticum that you will become. So both of these books talk about the transformation of man in this regard down to the detail of they con- They actually talk about the transformation of the sense organs. The Hermeticum says that when you have nose, your sense organs work differently. They're attuned to the divine. Your eyes and ears perceive reality differently. Marx goes on and on in the same book, The Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts, about how when you become a socialist, your eyes and ears perceive the world in a social way, and they're better. It's real weird when you read it that he's talking about that until you realize he probably stole it from the Corpus Hermeticum. I can't prove that. It's just suspicious. And it fits the mold exactly because there's those with nose and those without nose. And if nose nose in Marxism, the divine mind is being a socialist. Wissenschaft, Leitcher, Socialism, the scientific socialism, socialist man. It's positive transcendence of private property as human self-estrangement, returning to his species being. So socialist man lives with nose. Other man is irrational and falls into the desires of his passions, which if we go to critical theory are constructed by the consumer society that keeps you trapped in them forever. It's all the same stuff. And the way that it works for Marxist thought is that the bourgeois demiurge convinces you to separate yourself from the nose. Marx said this is done by ideology. The bourgeoisie tell you a story about why that's the right thing, how that's how society really works, and it justifies their own place. Man doesn't separate himself from God or the nose, as in the hermetic creation myth specifically, because Marx is a Gnostic. He is separated from it by the demiurge, which for him is the bourgeoisie. You are separated from your species being by the estrangement of labor, by being forced to work for the producing, or the producing class. I guess the owning class, pardon me. I am on Eastern time. We see this again and again and again in this kind of continuous lines of literature and horrible things that have happened in the past several hundred years in history. Hegel's philosopher has access to Vernunft, which is nose. Everybody else does not. They're not philosophers no nose. It's hermetic. Marx is socialist man. I just went through it. Has nose to everybody else. No nose. It's hermetic. The Nazis and the New Age theosophists, turn out they're kind of the same people in a way, have nose. The Aryans, I should say, in there have nose. What one of the people that Hitler stole his ideas from, Helena Blavatsky, called the fifth root race. The Aryans have mind. They're on a higher level. Everyone else, the folk, don't have nose. The Jews certainly don't. They're the most inferior race, is what he says. They lack nose completely. He has a racial occult belief that he stole from a theosophist named Helena Blavatsky. Max Horkheimer devises the critical theorist who has nose, a second dimension of thought above the traditional theorist who doesn't. The woke have the critical conscious who have no's over the falsely conscious who don't. The World Economic Forum has its expert stakeholders who have no's over you and especially the deplorables who do not. They're all hermetic. Yuval Noah Harari, the weirdo from the World Economic Forum, talks about the creative class which has no's and is allowed to be creative over the useless eaters as he calls them, who don't. It's all the same hermetic religion, sometimes with different amounts of Gnosticism thrown in. 
and the textual evidence and the historical evidence that Hegel and his sources to use as a particular transitional point in history in the German philosophy, including that Boma, 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 Burma, Boma has an umlaut, I can't do it. Oettinger, who also has an umlaut, and we can't do it. Goethe, who also has an umlaut, and we can't do it. All these freaking umlauts, bad Germans, the Swabian Pietists, the Rosicrucians, all of these weird secret sects that were floating around in the esoteric religious milieu were extraordinary influential on Hegel. This isn't in doubt. He quotes them, he holds them up, and he draws off of them enormously. It's not even in doubt. Hegel was fully hermetic. There's an entire book by Glenn Alexander McGee called Hegel and the Hermetic Tradition that lays out the case unambiguously and absolutely. Because of that, he was also small genostic. He believed he had seen behind the curtain, and he was taking cabinet orders from God as a philosopher and writing them down, as he said, as said in one of his logic books. Marx's dialectical materialism, which is the process that Marxism uses, ripped off straight from that. It's just a material Gnostic inversion of Hegel's dialectic. He stood it on its head, is what he said. He took Hegel's method, stood it on its head, which turned out to be Plato's method, which turns out to be that Republic pyramid, and stood it on its head. The Hermeticism and the Gnosticism is unambiguous in a continuous line from the Corpus Hermeticum to the World Economic Forum and the United Nations today. Woke is esoteric religion, period. So now we have to look at this. Thanks to these secret religions of the West, we have three paradigms, not two. Three gods of the West. I wanted to write an essay for like a year called The Three Gods of the West. I never got around to it. You have... In the faith domain, God, as you all think of it. In the reason domain, you have what we'll use from the founders, nature's God. And in the Gnostic domain, you have the esoteric God, which has a completely different religion, a completely different process, a completely different way of interpreting the world that's very powerfully self-serving and very powerfully destructive. Faith gives over to things like piety and religion, but it places authority in God and those who serve God. Reason gives over to understanding and science and liberalism by answering the question by saying that nobody deserves any authority in anything, but you can earn it or borrow it by certain processes. Gnosis gives over to what they call consciousness. You're awakened to the secret truth. You're conscious of it, and it causes cults. And their answer is that they deserve authority because they know and you don't. Remember what they attributed to Trump? saying that he was a dictator in the making, I alone can fix it. They tried to pin Gnosticism on him to hold him up like he was a dictator in the making. And it gets in its position, Gnosticism gets in its position through parasitism. It poses as the other two according to which one gives it more standing in the moment. So in the 15 and 1600s, it pretended it was religion. And you had huge flourishings of things like Rosicrucianism, which pretended to be Christian. Swedenborgianism or whatever, which pretended to be Christian. Kabbalah or Kabbalah, which pretended to be Christian and Jewish. Everybody thinks it's just Jewish. It was both. You have all these kind of weird sects latching on to the major religions. Swabian pietism was Lutherism, Lutheranism by name, but it was hermeticism in practice. And that's where Hegel was trained as a theologian by other people who were theologians in the same tradition. On the other hand, it calls itself science when science is in power and it does scientism. We, are, we just lived through that and we're still living through it. It doesn't need more explanation. But the parasite maneuver is always the dialectical inversion. That thing you do, we do it too, but we do it better both morally and more completely. It's for, for Numftover, for Stand, all the way down, to use the German from Hegel. And the key issue in practice is how these religions organize our societies. This is why it matters. This is why it matters. Because the question of who deserves political authority in particular is, in, is at the center. The World Economic Forum is answering the question for itself of who deserves political authority, and it's the stakeholders, of course. Over governments, they're going to pair up with the corporations through the stakeholders to have absolute authority. Through faith is the third leg of the stool. They answer the questions. 
Who deserves political authority? And the answer that the liberal or reason domain gives is nobody. Not a single damn one of you. Man is not God and whatever that means. And so while we can know it's finite and it's limited, we have to therefore be humble. We have to be circumspect. And if we have wisdom, we will reluctantly accept service when our peers or our work, our genuine expertise enables it. And when we serve in a political position, we serve in the common welfare with, for, and by the authority of the people. The faith reply, who deserves political authority? The liberal reply was nobody. The faith reply is nobody, really. Why? Because we're men, not God. God alone has authority. He's the only seat of authority. So only those who might serve God faithfully deserve to have the opportunity to serve people in positions of worldly authority. Its disposition, again, is therefore of humility. The faithful reluctantly accept their call to serve in worldly authority, and when they do, they serve to glorify God. You hear that again and again and again in churches like this. We heard it from Charlie Kirk yesterday. And again, these two have this thing in common called humility. So when these two humble dispositions get together, they form something stronger than either on their own. Our friend, we'll call him Stephen Jay Gould, said that there are these non-overlapping magisteria, the two non-overlapping magisteria of science and religion, or of faith and reason. And no, that's not quite correct. They are not non-overlapping because they're busy shaking hands when you have a successful society. They're not the same thing. They don't operate the same way, but they must work together as friends to bring out the secret sauce of the West, what Ben Shapiro referred to as Athens plus Jerusalem. Faith and reason operating in harmony make the West work. It works not only because it's successful in its own rights on a positive claim, but because it boxes out or gatekeeps the Gnostics. Athens plus Jerusalem keeps Alexandria at bay. Reason requires faith for its first principles. I watched people around me, friends of mine that were in the atheism movement back in the day, we were having a conversation with Brett Weinstein, and Brett Weinstein said that. You must have faith in the first principles that the world is ordered and that we can know something or science can't get off the ground. And these guys just went berserk and couldn't handle it. Faith. And they missed the whole point. You don't know everything because you're not God is the original disposition behind actually attaining understanding. That means faith in the humility that comes with it and the ability to ground your reason to check your work prevents temptations to Gnosticism. It keeps it humble and keeps its feet on the ground. Faith, however, like I said yesterday, requires reason to keep it sane. You have the guy talking to God through his hair dryer. The second you start saying anything that's a faith-shaped claim might be true. Reason keeps faith out of gnosis. I talked to God and said we're going to make a whole new world order. Uh-oh. Might be a, her- a heretic. John 1.1 1, 1 makes clear that Logos is king because that's what grounds comprehensibility like we heard from vocal distance earlier. And that's reason in some sense, but also something more. But the Hermeticum says instead that there's no the mind and that that's something special for the initiates to have. When these two together, faith and reason, get together, when they shake hands, they ward off the Gnostic catastrophe And it's always a catastrophe, and it's always going to get taken over by tyrants or run itself into the destructive ground. This is the secret sauce of the West. You can write it down. It's faith bolstered and checked by reason, and reason supported and checked by faith. That's what makes the West work. So why do we have to gatekeep the Gnostics in the first place? Because they're not humble. They're arrogant hubris, literally, which was a Greek term that referred to thinking that you're God. It's because of their answer to the question of who deserves political authority. The Gnostic reply, notice I did the other two, nobody and nobody really. What's the Gnostic reply? Who deserves political authority? 
We do. We deserve political authority because we know and you don't. That's their answer. You remember the Simpsons? Who keeps the metric system down? Da, da, da. We do. We do. Uh. The Simpsons is always right. This is going to lead to a tyranny every time except for one case. When it's a personal, weirdo, spiritual quest and the guy ends up meditating in a cave till he dies. The second you think it's your job to save humanity except by your weird spiritual practice in a cave, you're going to lead people into blenders. You heard it in the Corpus Hermeticum. Don't delay. You must do this and save humanity. And imagine what you'd be like if you truly, genuinely believed like Catherine would that you had seen the image of the divine mind, how you'd act. Imagine that you knew and were certain in your heart of hearts that you knew God's plan for everybody and everything. How would you act? And that most other people haven't and their dumb blind sheep know better than animals. How would you act? And they're not even initiates. They're not even pure they're not worthy. They're less than you. They're no better than animals given into their desires. They're blind. They're falsely conscious. And then if you add in the belief that this is only going to work if everybody does it together. It's not that you, a man, saves the world. It's that you, man, in the collective, saves the world. If you believe that, what are you going to do? You're going to become or support a tyranny. That's why you must gatekeep the Gnostics. It's not just about souls. It's not just about crazy people driving people nuts. It's that this tends to tyranny every time. And it creates an easily gameable, easily corruptible structure by which frauds will rise to the top. And anywhere frauds rise to the top, psychopaths will win eventually. They will learn to game the system and you'd have a Stalin or a Mao before you know it. Or a Schwab. It's the parasitism that Gnosis uses to gain that political authority from the gatekeepers. It plays on the receptor sites that reason and faith have, because neither is perfect on its own, or at all. It steals it, or I should say it steals it. That was pretty good, wasn't it? It comes to the receptors, the, the places where Reason and faith are least confident and plays into those, just like with Eve. You know, you got lied to. It's not really like that. Take a bite. It comes to reason or to science and says, well, you say that nobody deserves political authority. Well, you don't. That's true. And all of a sudden, you say, I don't deserve political authority. They say, nobody deserves political authority. That's right, you don't. And you say, I don't deserve political authority. Don't worry, don't worry we got this. We understand things you don't. We'll take it from here. It's complicated. Don't ask us. It's super complicated. We'll handle it. Nobody would understand it. Super arcane. It comes to people who are faithful. And it says, well, only the faithful who really serve deserve political authority. Only the righteous, therefore, shall serve. But what makes you believe you're righteous? We actually know deeper aspects of your faith than you do. Did you know Jesus was just a Buddha or whatever it happens to be? And it usurps the authority. We'll serve even better than you will. We understand your faith even better. We know what love thy neighbor means better than you. Better make us public health officials. Going to have to make you wear a mask on a plane for two years. So what we covered a little bit ago is that we know that communists are Gnostics and Hermetics then, but I want to point out that they're rivals, not their opposites, they're rivals, are two, reactionaries and fascists. Same thing, Plato's Republic, the pyramid of gold, silver, and bronze people. The philosophers had gold woven into their souls by the gods. That's why they get to be philosophers and kings. Their guardians had silver woven into their souls by the gods. Therefore, they get to be the guardians, the warriors, the military, the praetorian guard, the three-letter agencies. The people who do most of the other important things in society had the lower metals, bronze, iron, whatever. It depends on if you want to do the seven that they laid out or if you just want to do what Plato actually said, which was gold, silver, and bronze. And so there's this pyramid of people that orders the perfect republic. 
What you have actually is that the reactionaries and the communists, if you want to use those, and also the Hegel, they all believe in this structure of reality. The Hegel view is, well, Plato's right about the structure of society. It should be this pyramid with the philosopher kings on top. That's the is description. What about ought? Well, it should be that way too. That's how it should be. There are great people who should be on top. Okay, that's us. Marx stands it on its head. He says Plato's right about the is, the structure of society, but he has the order, the ought, upside down. We should flip it over. But of course, an upside down pyramid won't work, so we'll place ourselves in the center so we get to be on top. We have to center the right people, and mar- right? It's always centering. Decenter whiteness, center us, because when they flip the pyramid over, whoever's in the center gets to be on top now. That's why. That's why. Reactionaries are with Hegel. Structure of society is right. Some of us actually are kind of ordained to understand how the world works, and we really should be in charge. We can't let the hoi polloi have it, the proletariat. They're stupid. They won't put a good, you know, well-deserving monarch in charge of everything. We would, and it should be that way. Reactionaries are Gnostics with a hardline conservative-looking mindset that's actually equally progressive. They're a Gnostic parasite on conservatism, thus becoming a perennial rival, not opponent, of progressive Gnostics like Marxists. They also believe that either they alone deserve to rule or they alone know who deserves to rule. They know who's going to get to be the rightful king. If you listen to the neo-reactionaries today, that's exactly what they say. They, know who, they don't know the name of the person, but they'll know it when they see it. And I guarantee you it's one of them. Because they know better than anyone else how to organize society. They know better than anyone else how to get rid of the drag queens. They know how better than anyone else to set up a constitutional monarchy. And they usually, even if they start out good, this is called the bad emperor problem in China, in China uh, they usually become fascists, eventually. Maybe not now, maybe not in a few years, maybe not in two generations, but eventually, because megalomaniacal people, psychopaths, take over. What are fascists? They're Gnostics who reject the status quo, but accept the means that got us where we are so far. There are people who said systemic oppression in the past. Yes, that's what made us great, so we're going to do more of it. The Marxists are right. It is systemic oppression, and that's why we're so good. If you wonder who I'm paraphrasing there, I'm not joking. It's Hitler and Mein Kampf. That's what his answer was. Oppression was correct. That's what makes us great. So guess what? We're going to find the inferior people and impress the living crap out of them and become even better. And that's where we're going to be progress. So the reactionaries make a number of mistakes. Mistake number one, that we, the reactionaries, deserve political authority. That's the Gnostic answer, by the way. We need to go post-liberal. We need to abandon this idea that nobody truly deserves political authority. Our people deserve it. We need to grab the bat so that the communists can't knock it over. They think this because they don't understand liberalism, or at least they exploit arguments against liberalism that fail to understand what it is. They say, oh, but it doesn't really find, it's not a fulfilling religion. It's secular religion, and it doesn't fulfill you. If liberalism actually starts with the premise that we're not God and therefore we don't know what the right religion is, it can't possibly tell you what the right religion is. So you're accusing it on something that it's not supposed to be. That's something that somebody, maybe with a capital A, accuse or would do. Read your scriptures. Accuse somebody of something incorrectly in order to depose them and seize authority, worldly authority particularly. Reactionary mistake number two is what I mentioned a minute ago, is that oppression created success, so we're going to continue oppressing. Hitler's whole race ideology was, if you don't mix, if, when you mix the races, they necessarily become a little bit less, so we're not going to mix the races and we're going to destroy inferior race stock to make sure it doesn't happen by mistake or by contamination or by influence. It's easy to see how this goes very wrong very fast. We'll repress the right people, don't worry. We know who the right people are with no's and who the ones that are wrong without no's are, and we'll oppress, the, we'll oppress the correct people, unlike your enemies who've been oppressing the wrong people, namely you. You should be very upset. You should be fearful and desperate and angry and frustrated and give way to the dark side. 
Just strike down your dad, Luke. Reactionary mistake number three is to blame a scapegoat class for this problem, anti-Semitism in particular. It usually will associate a scapegoat, a scapegoat class with the wrong position, lacking nose or having wrong Gnosticism, false Gnosticism. That's where you find the rivals. The communists have no Gnosticism, but it's fake. It's a counterfeit. We have to destroy them. The mystics in your religion are all kinds of wrong. We're going to destroy them. Now, this is where I said earlier that it matters a lot that when you have Christians speaking Christian mysticism, Christians won't see it. But if, say, you have Jews speaking Jewish mysticism, Christians are going to be like, that's weird. When the Fabian socialists who were Protestants spoke their weirdo magic spells, except when George Bernard Shaw got on a video and it was very obvious, says, oh, I can think of millions of people I would like to kill. Can't you think of people you would like to kill? Except when he did stuff like that, it was recognizable. He seemed like a guy who was just a little screwy. When you have a wizard posing as your faith, he looks a little screwy. But when he starts speaking in Jewish symbolism for his mysticism, it sticks out. You're like, oh, that's bad. And it's Jewish. They're the problem. And so you read Mein Kampf, which is a worthwhile project if you want to understand evil. And you have Hitler saying, I argued with the communists every day. I argued with them until I went hoarse. I went to lunch and drank my bottle of milk. I came back and argued with them some more. You can never convince them. Blah, 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 a few pages of this. And then he says, then one day I realized it. They're all Jews. The rest is really ugly history. It's very important to realize that mysticism written in the language that's parasitizing you, the mosquito that lands on your skin, you don't feel it. But you see it when it lands on somebody else and you're like, oh, it's their problem. They must have eaten onions or something and that attracts mosquitoes. It's a bad metaphor. But the idea is that when it's expressed, say, in terms of Jewish Kabbalah, it sticks out and you think that's what Judaism is and then you run down the wrong roads if you're accepting things like oppression is the path to glory and that we must scapegoat our enemies to gain power, and that we deserve political authority. The fourth mistake is the Gnostic mistake at heart, which is that we can use the dialectic itself or ourselves to win. We can use their methods. What did Hitler say he did? I learned so much about the communists that I adapted his own methods to my agenda. It's exactly what he says he did. And he created, instead of international socialism, national socialism. He says that himself explicitly in Mein Kampf. I learned from them. I stole their methods. I appropriated it to my project. I can take the ring to Minas Tirith and defeat Sauron. Everybody who picks up Gnosticism thinks that they have the higher truth that is the only real truth that nobody else knows. They always think they're doing good while they're doing insane evil. And their reactionary has a receptor. The conservative, in a sense, has a receptor where this virus attaches, the parasite attaches, and it's fear, hate, and desperation. Somebody needs to do something. Nothing's happening. I'm so pissed off. Somebody stop the drag queens, and the next thing you know... Somebody does something stupid and we have drag Floyd. And the cities are on fire again. It's a fear vacuum. They pull you into fear and desperation. Nothing can fix this except going berserk, going hard on the Gnostic terms of the reactionary. This requires a vacuum of faith. Why do you think Christians, when they talk about these huge existential things, always remind you God wins? Because if you have faith, you don't overreact and act stupid. Faith curbs it. It is a vacuum of reason. It's crazy. You know better. It doesn't make sense. It's fear and desperation. And like I mentioned, Luke Skywalker, if you watch The Empire Strikes Back, when he goes into the cave and is confronted by Yoda magic with Darth Vader... He gives in to his fear and anger, and he cuts Vader's head off, and the helmet comes off, and it's Luke's head under the helmet. He became the thing he hates. 
when he's fighting Darth Vader at the end of Return of the Jedi, and you have creepy Emperor Palpatine laughing and doing the lightning thing, he's like, yes, give in to your fear and anger. The dark side is so powerful. And you become a Jedi by overcoming that. That's the morality story in Star Wars. You become the super good guy by not falling into that. As you gain power, you refuse hatred, fear, anger. You don't take the ring to Minas Tirith and try to, try to wield it. Even if you think you're doing it for good. Go read why Galadriel and Gandalf refuse the ring if you want. I would give in to pity. I would be moved by the desire to do good and turn into a tyrant far worse. They say that. They're the emblems of the wise in the story. These are morality tales for you to understand these important topics. So these weaknesses of reason and faith cause the Gnostic parasite to be able to take over. It's easier to get sick when you're not well rested, when you're falling apart, when something's going on, you're very stressed, when you're your defenses are weakened, and your defenses are going to be strongest in this kind of conceptual space when you have both reason and faith operating. It turns out that they are both weak on their own. Reason is weak through, I mean, the critical theorists called it the dialectic of enlightenment, as reason eschews faith more and more and more as it tries to get hyper-reasonable and throw faith right out the window to give up its basis, to give up its Grounding, it's humility. Reason becomes its own set of myths, its own unreason. We call it the science. We all know how it works. It starts to become arrogant and overreaches itself. You have people like Yuval Noah Harari that are way down this path in the, in the World Economic Forum, literally writing a book called the, about the future of humanity called Homo Deus. God-man is the title of his book. In Latin, not Homo sapiens, not wise man. We should replace it with God-man. Not Sophia wisdom. We become god it gets way out over its sensibilities. Gnosis creeps in when reason gets out of control, loses its grounding. And what do we end up with? The UNWEF, the United Nations and the World Economic Forum, saying things like that we're going to complete nature, we're going to do transhumanism as we heard about earlier today, we're going to become the masters of nature rather than its stewards. We adopt the belief that we can know and learn everything. We think like Gandalf or Galadriel had they taken the ring that we would do good with it. Think of all the good we could do. We could eradicate hunger. We could eradicate disease. We could eradicate poverty. Aren't those like the first three of the goals? Or They are three of them. I don't know if they're the first three. The processes of reason are also slow on purpose. They're deliberative. They check their work. So autocracies like China can outmaneuver them. So we can say we have to become like them in order to be able to compete with their speed. But the problem with reason losing to gnosis is that when reason becomes gnosis, it falls into the trap that the only thing that, it can, that can possibly defeat its march toward progress, its march toward the utopia or the kingdom, is death. And so it must fixate on defeating death alone. And we're back to the UNWEF the United Nations and World Economic Forum, and their project. The problems with faith, ultimately, is that faith is confidence in the unseen. It takes a leap into trust. There are also strong temptations of the deceiver. That's why you have Matthew 4 in your Bibles. God works in mysterious ways. That can get frustrating and scary. You don't know if it's going to work. It's hard to trust. You doubt. You get worried. You think it might not come in your lifetime. It might not come in your children's lifetime. God tends to work through people. So does evil. Be careful. It gets really hard to, to put trust in the unseen, though, when things get bad. And to go read your Old Testament, it's literally that story told again and again and again and again with a prophet that comes and smacks society back on track. There are lots of temptations the faithful, just like the reasonable, if you will, are not immune to those. Money, power, the ability to do good in the world affect the faithful and the reasonable. You want more grant money? There's your scientist writing corrupt science. You wanted that seminary you always wanted to build? You wanted to expand your ministry into whatever domain? Isn't it funny? We looked at your plans. We thought they're great. This is exactly the amount of money is how much is excess in our budget. You need 12 mil? Let's go. 
I've noticed that Christians are particularly sensitive to their legacies more than a lot of other people. Oh my gosh, they're going to take my name. They're going to, they're going to say I was a racist and erase everything I did for the church. I'll be forgotten. Because that's what you guys are supposed to shoot for, right? Is being remembered as opposed to something else. I don't want to get into your theology. Sometimes people get sucked into their creature comforts. Maybe they like their teddy bear. I don't know. Sometimes they just get sucked in. I've said the thing about talking to your hair dryer quite glibly, but they believe sometimes that they, they can't, it would be a sin to take a bite from the, tree of fruit, or the fruit of the tree of knowledge, but maybe it's okay to take a nibble. That's this whole hermeneutical thing we were talking about earlier. People start thinking that they have the secret knowledge behind the knowledge, beside the knowledge, within the knowledge, outside the knowledge, the whatever, the whatever, the whatever. That was a lot of words, but that's what it is. It's tempting. It's tempting. And maybe you have an experience. Maybe you, you know, you're fasting, you're praying or whatever, and you believe that you've had a vision, or maybe you did have a vision. I'm not going to question you, but you can get misled by that. We heard that the Catherine Wood had a dream, and she was like, well, it's probably Satan. And she said, better do it anyway, it was God. It's temptation. The temptation is there. You can get led by your heart and lose sense of your head. Your reason lapsed, and your faith got out ahead of you. The history of the West over the last 500 years, which we call a trajectory that we call the Enlightenment, which is still unfolding. In fact, it's just reigniting. The internet is actually taking us into a new phase, a second Enlightenment. That's a whole podcast that you should go listen to it. Welcome to Second Enlightenment, it's its title. But there were reactions to try to stop the Enlightenment, and there's a reaction now to try to stop the Second Enlightenment. The World Economic Forum and UN are really behind that. They don't want the Enlightenment because it will depose the Gnostics. These frauds that have risen to the top that are trying to control everything are going to be shown to be frauds. We see story after story after story already of their frauds. Twitter starts putting out the Twitter files. They put out number three earlier today. The first thing I saw, the guy was doing the thing, Matt Taibbi or whatever, is doing his thread super slow. And it's like tweet number three or two. And I'm like, how far down before we find out there was a three-letter agency guy tied into this? It's been both in the other two already. These corruptions are everywhere, and they're getting, they get exposed by this kind of ability to start sharing information and doing our own research and things. So the enlightenment's unfolding, but there's been a reaction. There's a reaction again now. But there were two reactions, and a lot of people think there was a counter-enlightenment. I think there was a kind of faith-driven one that was afraid of, the, the, of kind of the Hume skepticism, but then there was one that was the wizards pretending to be faithful, saying, no, we need to make room for wizardry as well. And that's the secret religions having their own reaction. And that one was for the mystery religions, and it is what I call the romantic reaction. So all of your romantic poets, I know you love to read them, all your romantic films, sorry, uh, romantic comedy, loving women. Uh Uh-oh, I'm just kidding about that one, maybe, maybe, (laughs) maybe. That's the French Revolution. That's postmodernism. From the French Revolution, from Rousseau's philosophy, not only comes the French Revolution, I should say, but comes directly Romanticism. From Romanticism comes Existentialism. From Existentialism comes Structuralism. From Structuralism comes Post-Structuralism. From Post-Structuralism comes Postmodernism. It's a straight line. All French. Didn't even leave the country. It's the same thing. Progressivism as a movement, whether it tapped into these Rousseauian lines, whether it tapped into Marxist lines, which are still Rousseauian lines, whether it tapped into the New Age theosophy lines, like we have heavily in the late 19th and early 20th centuries with the progressive movement, getting into New Age occult practices and beliefs about the world, following Madame Blavatsky that I mentioned earlier, following Alice Bailey, one of her disciples, following Margaret Sanger, one of her disciples, following Annie Besant, one of her disciples, and a Fabian socialist, and thus the Fabian socialist as well, following from Blavatsky through Hitler in the Nazi progressive project. Progressivism is romanticism. It's imagining the world you're going to create, presupposing it as its beginning and finding it at its end or however the circle thing works. It's just a Gnostic perversion of the Enlightenment liberal project. It's a simulacrum of it. And it's given birth to communism, postmodernism, Nazism, New Age occultism, which turns out to have given birth to social emotional learning and common core and education, but that's another podcast coming soon. (laughs) Yeah, it's dark. These are all Gnostic parasites on the secret sauce of the West, which is the handshake of faith and reason. 
They both have to be strong for them to shake hands and get along. They both have to be confident in their own domains and willing to borrow from the others and recognize what they give to each other. So the solution to this problem of a parasite on this is, first of all, we must strengthen that. We must heal the body if we're going to be cured, but we also have to identify and neutralize the parasite. We have to recognize that we're dealing with hermetic faiths pretending to be science and politics and economics and even fake Christianity, mere simulacrity, as it were. We, have to, we don't want to do the reactionary thing and kill the body. Claim the ring for ourselves and become a ring wraith. Instead, we have to figure out how the wizard circle works, why we can't detect the parasite and break the frame. We have to expose that. They're controlling the psychological framing, the linguistic framing, the narrative framing of everything, and you have to break the frame to step out of the frame and then expose the frame and then reassert the constitutional order that was built on the combination of reason and faith that works, that created the American experiment. What that means in practice is figuring out ways to feed people red pills and nourish them back to health when they see the problem. You, want, you may not be the person that can crack a woke person out of their beliefs, that can convince them to change their mind, but you want to be positioned for every person you can think of in your life where it might matter to be the person that they're willing and able to come talk to, that you can say, oh, you saw that you're being lied to. Let me talk to you about this. Let me tell you my experience. Let me show you some other things you might be being lied to about. Get them to understand and leave mere simulacrity. In other words, get based. Tomorrow in the afternoon, to close this thing, I will talk about how they do this magic, and I promise you not to oversell it and then fail. We'll see what happens. I don't presuppose my circles in the beginnings and ends. I'm going to tell you how do they do this magic trick, and you are going to be shocked at how much it explains about the world you live in. Thank you. See you tomorrow. <laughs>